instinct taking photographs of people is often to try and put the entire person in the shot but if you include their feet and their shoes and the ground it can all get a bit messy so play it slightly safer and go for a three-quarter length down to the knees. So there we have it, three very different shots, just three paces apart, all shot on the same lens. The eyeline of the subject of your photograph can dramatically change the mood of the picture. Staring straight into the camera creates something really intense, whereas if you're looking just off to the side, it sort of lightens the atmosphere a bit. I'm going to demonstrate with three photographs of Dominica. They'll all be exactly the same frame, but with three different eyelines. So if you just look straight into me for this first one. OK. And then the next one, if you look at my hand just up a little bit, yeah, that's fine. Stay there. Yeah. And now the final one, as far as you can see, off into the top corner there. OK, so three different shots, same framing, three different eye lines, and three very different moods. Portrait photography is really about preparation, consideration and using all the technology available to you. If, for example, your camera has Wi-Fi, like the 6D, this is a great feature to use for portraits, as you can instantly send the results to a larger device, like your laptop. This allows you to check all your shots on a bigger screen, so you can see what needs adjusting while you're working. Once you feel comfortable enough with the technical aspects of your gear, you can concentrate on taking the time to get your framing and composition right. So, you've mastered the technical elements, now you need to learn how to get exactly what you want from your model or subject. The way your subject poses is really important in the story that you're trying to tell with your photograph. There's nothing worse than somebody just standing stock still, not moving at all. So it's all about body language between each shot that you take. Maybe suggest that they move. You can come up with some ideas for poses that you'd like to see, but don't forget, it's all about communication. There are two of you creating this photograph, and you'll probably find that the model feels much more relaxed if they're posing how they feel comfortable as well. So between you, working with two heads, rather than one, you can then create something really interesting. The first technique I wanted to try out was really getting his eyes in focus, so that obviously the focus was Dylan. Um, and so that made his expression more clear and just made the picture better. Um, the second technique to kind of get that, I needed to use high-speed burst mode. It made it a lot easier because obviously his expression was changing all the time and to use that quickly made it really easy. I think the composition of the photo actually works quite well in this picture. Um, they're all kind of framed in a triangle, which is nice. They all have equal parts of the image as well. He did his utmost not to want to look into the camera and therefore I regarded that as part of the look. And there's a slight darkness on one side of the face, which is trying to sort of indicate his sort of secret side of his personality. I think also a very important thing that I've learned is focusing on the eyes. If you get that only connect connection with the camera and the eye, the viewer's going to actually sort of take note of that picture. I prefer set up portraits because you can you have more control over the overall image that you come out with. It's a final image from a photo shoot I did for college for a supernatural project. The lighting in this photo was a single tungsten light in the corner of the room to get a shadow on one side of her face. It's really important to get the focus of her eyes because it draws the emotion out of the model and sort of makes you think about the photo even more. I'm a photographer who specialises in people, portraits and events. Now family scenes can throw up lots of challenges and I'm going to show you how you can really control your environment so that you can get some dramatic and amazing images. When you're taking candid portraits at an event, make sure you find the best location for your images. 
strong light is good, but out of direct sunlight is also good because it's nice and soft and diffused. And once you've looked around and you know what you've got to work with, think about the ways that you can frame the image. Sometimes trees and foliage can make a good frame for an image coming at the side or maybe all the way around, archways, doorways, fences, gates. These are all good geometric shapes that you can use. When you're taking portraits, it's all about the framing and the posing and of course the light. So I've got Gail here in front of the mirror. I've got um, natural light coming in through the window here. And I've put it by the mantelpiece here because I've got some great converging lines that will come from the corner of the frame if you position your camera just right in the right place. So the kind of things that I'm thinking about here, first of all, I'm going to see how much I can get in the frame and where those leading lines are going to come from. So I'm just going to have a, a quick look here through the, through the camera. Now, what I can see here, if I move out closer to the side, I can get both Gale and her reflection in the image, which makes quite a, a nice balanced shot gives you some symmetry to work with. I'm making sure that I'm focused on Gail's face. And yes, I like that, but I think maybe we could be a little bit more creative with the posing there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get Gail to look into the light, look into the window there, with a far away look on her face. It'll tell more of a story. I think this might be my shot. Yes, that's lovely. That's the one for me. Taking group family portraits can be a real challenge. If people are rigid and uncomfortable looking, then that's what you get. So it's a good idea to converse with, with your group so that they feel relaxed. They're relying on you really for direction of how to pose and where to pose or where to sit. If people are of a similar height, you can elevate the back row on a step. Think of all those kind of things and also think of the shape of the, the people make within the frame. Now the 16 to 35 millimeter 2.8 is a great lens to use for group portraiture, particularly if you're in a confined space indoors, because it does allow you to get everybody in and you don't have to get too far back. The problem with group photography is you've got so many faces there, there's going to be somebody pulling a face, speaking, blinking. Put your camera in continuous shoot mode and then you can take a number of frames, one after the other, and it'll really help you to get one good shot out of the set. With any group shot, one of the most important things to check is that you've got everybody in focus. Now if you were using a wide aperture in low light, you might be choosing an aperture maybe of 2.8 or something like that. But that's going to give you a really narrow depth of field. So there is a danger, especially when you've got some people in front of others, that not all of them are going to be in focus. So if you want a greater depth of field, probably the best bet is to increase your ISO, which will allow you to alter your aperture so that you've got a wide depth of field. When you're taking candid portraits, you're going to have to be really familiar with your camera and know where the dials are because you kind of have to move fast to capture those magic moments of the day. Moments like today we're going to try and catch Grandad blowing out of his candles. It's a vital moment and you, you need to be there in position with an idea in your head, your camera set properly before you take the shot. Otherwise, you have a danger of missing it. So we're going to have to think about what kind of lens you're going to use for that because it's going to make a dramatic impact on the finished frame. If you don't want to get too involved, if you don't want to influence the situation, you may want to take a step back and take an image using a longer lens. Something like the 70 to 200, that will be a good option for a long shot. Alternatively, you could use something like the 16 to 35 millimeter, which will give you the opportunity to get up really close. And it gives you a lot more latitude for interesting angles. So some of my favorite shots are the ones that I've taken from underneath or from above. And using a wide angle, you have lots of scope for that. The other thing that you might need to consider is the light. Now, quite often indoors, you might be adding to the light by using flash, but here we're going to be using candlelight, and we don't really want to distract from that. It might add 
ambience and mood to the image. You might need to, for a start, up your ISO quite a lot so that you can get a fast enough shutter speed, say no less than 250th of a second, to capture that moment. So granddad's in focus. You might have a little bit of movement in the candles, but that's great because sometimes movement can add a lot of ambience to, to an image. When taking pictures at an event or a party, then it's good to give your image some kind of context. Now, you can do that using props or you can do that using your background. Um, if you're going to do it with props, I mean, at a party, you might have balloons or streamers or party tutors. There's a lot of scope there to get some drama and some movement into an image. You're also going to be quite um, concerned with the background. Sometimes there's going to be objects in there that just look awkward, that don't work with the composition. So ways to get rid of that will be either to crop in really tight or to use a wide aperture. That's a small number, wide aperture, and that's going to defocus your background and so that you're just concentrating on the subject. When you're taking photographs outside, it's really important to give careful consideration to your background, because that's going to really make or break your image. Before you do your shoot, you can have a look around and see if you can find any interesting areas. Think about symmetry, you can look at the way the plants might frame your image. But failing all that, then what you're going to have to look for is a really simple background. So look for neutral, plain colours. Now, if you've got um, a couple that are fairly close to a background, then you're going to need to use a really wide aperture to throw that background out of focus. And here I'm using the Canon 85mm 1.8, and I'm using it wide open at 1.8. And even though my couple were fairly close to that background, it was nice and subtle and nice and blurred and not too intrusive. And because it was a, a simple colour, it really worked to enhance the image. If you're going to be taking pictures outdoors, it might not be the obvious choice to put a flash on your camera, but for me, it's one of the most useful pieces of kits for taking portraiture outdoors. There's lots of situations where the light might be tricky, could be really strong sunlight hitting the side of somebody's face, casting nasty black shadows across the face. It's not a flattering look. So that's one instance where using a flash on your camera can really make a difference to diffuse the light or balance the light in the face. Another situation that I often use it for is in a backlit situation. Maybe you found a piece of sky that's plain and you can put your subjects in front of it, have a lovely, clean, clear background, but then your subjects are going to be backlit. So you're going to have to meet up for the sky using the built-in metering system in your camera and then just pop on the flash. So the flash really is an incredible tool for outdoor portraiture. So whether you're taking portraits inside or out, you're going to face quite a lot of backlit situations. Here, it's quite nice to have the framing of the window around Grandad, who's um, just looking at his cards. Most of the light that's left today is going to come through that window and not much is going to be hitting his face. So I'm going to have to brighten his face somehow. I'll just take a shot to start with so you can see. So the exposure there is quite good, but um, Grandad there definitely needs a lot more light in his face. So what I'm going to do, I've got Olivia here ready with the silver reflector. Because we're rapidly losing light here, we're going to use the silver so that we've got the maximum amount of reflection. And I'm going to do that shot again. I think that the face could do with some more light. So I'm going to try flash. Now the problem if I use flash full on with Grandad here, that it's gonna be quite uninteresting. I'd have run into the danger of the light reflecting back from the window. So my best option would be to use um, an off camera flash. Now some cameras have a built-in flash transmitter, but for this one, I've got my transmitter popped on top of the camera there. So could you hold that? And then if you tilt it down slightly, and the reason for that is we're quite used to natural sunlight. So we expect usually for most of the, the light to come from above so that having it above will just make it look a little bit more natural. Now that's much better.
I like that exposure. The only problem that I have with it, I think, is that there are shadows on the nose that are slightly too hard. It's the same sort of thing that happens in bright sunlight. So I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to use a diffuser on the flashlight to soften the light. And I'm going to give it to Olivia here. And we're going to hold it in the same position, slightly above and down. But as I mentioned before, there was a shadow on the nose I didn't like. So one way of getting rid of that would be to move the light source. We'll have it a little bit more central, but not full on. That's a good exposure. That's the shot for me. We were shooting this based on Alice in Wonderland, so we really wanted to make it look like fantasy. We wanted to give the idea of Wonderland, so we ended up thinking of hanging flowers in the trees and adding little large playing cards and adding cupcakes and that sort of thing, just to make it a bit more magical. I think it was one of my first successful attempts at using off-camera flash. I pretty much just learned that a good place to play, put the light is 45 degrees between camera and model, so that's what I did. It reminds me, firstly, of like a great time in my life. Myself and loads of friends went over to Kerala in southern India. That particular photo was one of the first I took on, on the actual visit. The day itself was like it was busy and hot and sweaty and loads going on and noisy. But the shot itself is just, you know, shows a soul woman just kind of sitting there. It's very kind of calm. I wanted to get into doing portraits. So I had in my house a, a plaster cast of a Greek god. It's like he's used him for about a year, just constantly photographing him. Different lights, different shadows, with the Venetian blinds going over the front, making stripes and everything. And you really learn technique, because it's all white plaster. And so there was no skin color, nothing. So the only thing you had was light, just to give shadow. And I think I learned quite a lot from working on those, um, on, on that head. Welcome to After the Shot Digital Darkroom. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at Canon's digital photo professional software and showing you exactly what it can do. DPP is a piece of software that comes with your Canon camera and is packed full of features to help you organize, edit and process your images on a Mac or a PC. In this chapter, I'll show you how to get to grips with all the functions, including color correction, mono conversion, retouching and digital lens optimization. And then I'll leave you with some extra tips and tricks that I've learned. You can work with three different file formats in DPP, JPEGs, TIFFs or RAW files. A RAW file is an uncompressed image that contains all of the information that was recorded on the camera's sensor. So this is the most flexible file format to work with, with the added bonus that you can change the camera's settings that were used when the picture was taken. Whatever format you decide to shoot on, DPP will only allow you to export your finished photos as JPEGs or TIFFs. A TIFF file is a high resolution format that contains all of the uncompressed image data and is ideal for great printing. Because a RAW file contains so much information, it offers lots of options for processing the image. In DPP, you can tweak the exposure or change the contrast or the white balance, and you can always return to the original if you want to at a later date. So, now we're ready to start making the very most of our best pictures. When you open DPP, you'll see the main window, and over on the left-hand side here is the folder tree. That's where you can navigate through all the shots that you've taken and decide there which ones you want to work on in more detail. To kick off with, I'd recommend using the Quick Check tool. This allows you to quickly review your shots just clicking next here through all of the photos. And it's got a star rating, so you can say, well, I like that one. I'm going to do a bit more editing on that. You can see I've been through these already. And now I'm going to select those five-star images and add them to a collection that's already in there. So there we go, collection of six that I'm going to start editing. So now I'm going to move from the collection into the edit image window to start editing them one by one. So you can see here, on the right-hand side of the screen, we've got the tabs that are filled with all the tools that you're going to make your changes with. There are four principal tabs along the top, but the two you're going to be working mostly with are the RAW tab and the Lens tab. 
On the Raw tab, this is your main menu for changes. You've got adjustments to contrast, to white balance, to colours, and also a special histogram that shows you the dynamic range of your shot. The first thing I want to look at is exposure, and on this shot you can see the hillside on the right hand side here, it's a little bit dark, so I'm going to just adjust the exposure by using the brightness adjustment up on the top right hand side here, and as you can see I can just nudge it up and bring up the exposure of the shot. It's really tempting to overdo it sometimes, if you go right to the end of the scale you can see it's overexposed, so just be careful to do things in small increments. Now we'll check the white balance using the eyedropper tool on the right hand side here and touching it down on a grey or neutral part of the image and that will then apply an average white balance to the whole shot and make it look a bit more lifelike. Another way to adjust the colours is to use the tune button. Hit that and you can see it presents you with a colour wheel and you can drag around to make your shot slightly bluer or you could warm it up a bit and it will change the overall look of the photo. Using the colour tone and saturation sliders allow you to further improve and stylize your image, but if you ever find you've completely overdone it, like that, you can return to the original shot by just pressing reset. Now let's have a look at mono conversion. I think this shot could make a great black and white image. And to change the colour setup, we go to picture style here, and in the menu, select monochrome. Once you're into a monochrome setup, you can see that the colour and the saturation sliders change to filter effects and toning effects. The filter effects will subtly change the contrast in your shot, while the toning effects offer you different monochrome looks, like sepia, which looks great in this case. Now let's take a look at retouching. DPP is really useful for removing blemishes from your photographs. Sometimes particles of dust can get stuck to the sensor in your camera and they appear in your pictures as a small dark mark. The best way to repair your shot is to use the stamp tool. Once you're in here, you can go to 100% view and that allows you to locate the mark. Here it is, a clear smudge on the photo. In this case, it's darker than the background, so the repair tool I'm going to use is Repair Dark. Now that gives me a brush of a radius that I can change depending on the size of the blemish. And all I need to do is click over the top of it and the software will magically make it disappear. Unless you remove that speck of dust, it's going to affect your other photographs as well. But the good news is you can copy the repair that you've made to this one and then paste it into other pictures in the series. DPP software also includes a feature called Digital Lens Optimizer. This is an intelligent function that enhances your photograph based on specific data about the lens that you use to shoot it with. First off, you need to download free from the internet all the data about the lenses that you took on your shoot. Once you've done this, you can start adjusting the image using the ideal optical characteristics. This shot was taken on a 17 to 40 millimeter lens, and as you can see, it's got lots of detail right across the frame, and I want to really make the most of that. To start with, I'm going to set the sharpness to zero on the raw tab and then move into the lens tab to apply the optimizer by pressing tune. And now I can adjust the setting as required on a small area of the photo and then apply that to the whole shot. This is a really useful tool for getting the most out of every single shot. You can already use it with many Canon lenses and more are being added all the time. But overall, with DPP, my main piece of advice would be to practice with it. It's a fantastic tool for manipulating raw images, and the more you practice, the sooner you'll be operating in the realms of professional photographers. Let's have a quick look at some of the shots we've already manipulated in DPP. In this final chapter, we'll be returning to our experts for them to talk us through some of their favourite images from their own collections. They'll be giving you a few new things to try out, taken from techniques that they've used in the field. And with their many years of experience, we'll find out just what it takes to become an accomplished photographer. The Abandoned Series is a seven-year ongoing project. The, the whole series is to, is to question what happens to those things that we get rid of. The process is, is first finding the subjects, um, which in a way is difficult enough, but, uh, but once you've found the subject, or once I've found it, it's then really exercising extreme patience in just waiting for the right weather to shoot it. 
Probably one of the most successful images in the whole series is the, is the old car on the pole. Um, it's such a simple composition, but it really, really, really has worked well. If I had any advice to do similar pictures to the Abandoned series is look for iconic uh, subjects that, uh, that people will recognize straight away. Once you find them, they just need to be in the right environment. It's no good finding an old, rusted, clapped out piece of machinery that's standing in a modern garden. It's not going to suit this type of series. The other thing is, is getting in really close with a wide angle lens. I think that adds distortion. And once you've got distortion, you've got interest. Don't shoot from, from straightforward angles. Try to make it a lot more interesting. So, so look for those low camera angles and those high camera angles. It's going to help a lot. Lastly, I would say don't let your, your tripod dictate the situation. We place the tripod down, and the tripod becomes a convenient point of composition. I would rather that you handhold the camera, move in and out the picture, find exactly what you're looking for, be very purposed on where the camera needs to be, and then bring the tripod in and place it exactly in that position. When I'm out with my camera taking pictures, one of the things I really like to do is find a different perspective on something. I want people to see my images and go, that's different. It's different to what everybody else is publishing or everything everybody else is taking. Take, for example, um, this particular picture of the lady in the hat. Now, in that picture, you can't see her eyes. You know, that's quite an unusual way to take a photograph. But here it's all about the hat and the lips and the hands. My three tips for getting a different perspective are to think about the angle and be quite adventurous with the angles that you take photographs at. Get high, get low, move it around a bit. My second tip would be get in close, particularly with a wide angle lens. One of the biggest mistakes is not to be close enough to your subject. Things look further away when you use a wide angle lens than you imagine they would. You need something of interest in your foreground and you can create a lot of drama by having something really big in the foreground. My final tip would be engage with people, complete strangers on the street. There's no harm in asking them and nine times out of ten they're perfectly happy to have their picture taken. And if you start talking to people, you'll get a lot better results. Some of my favourite images have most definitely been working in moonlight. I took my first moonlight photograph and literally could not believe what I was seeing. It's given me a real great sense of, uh, of wonder with photography. When you first step out into the darkness, firstly, your eyes do not see in colour. You'll only be able to see tones. So this in itself makes it quite, quite concerning as to what you're uh, actually doing. But once your eyes start to adjust, it can be a very special moment to, uh, to photograph and explore uh, a local area within the moonlight. My first tip would be to make sure you're using a reasonably high ISO. This will actually give you the ability to freeze the stars and stop you getting small star trails. The longer the shutter speed is, then the longer the star trails will become. It's extremely important to be able to find a nice balance between how far you can push the camera's technology and also how far you can push your own creativity. Tip number two is to use wide apertures. Make sure that also when using f2.8 that you're not getting too close to your subject matter. If you get close to your subject matter, the bottom of the image will be out of focus. So you need to keep the camera very high up in order to uh, make sure that you don't lose important focus throughout the image. My final tip would be to light the scene with torches. Sometimes you're shooting into the moonlight. So for example, you might find that the moon is in the shot. It really rounds things off nicely, having uh, the light source within the top of the frame. But the object you're shooting, say a bridge or something of that, those lines, is actually lit then from behind. So just a small blast, even with a, the ambient light coming off a, a small head torch, can be enough to light the scene and give that extra sense of appeal. We've come to the end of the final chapter of this DVD. With the help of our three fantastic experts, we've offered you a huge range of tips and tutorials on the techniques and the camera equipment that you'll need in different situations. Photography is a blend between creative thinking and technical know-how. It's by understanding both the equipment you're using and the principles of photography that you'll be able to realise your creative ambitions. 
The fundamentals that we've offered on this DVD will help you to shoot stunning shots exactly how you envisioned them.